Rick Johnson is the author of this book, Becoming Your Spouse's Better Half, Why Differences Make a Marriage Great. Uh, Rick is a, is a proven coach. Uh, he's written a number of books. He's uh, got a ministry called Better Dads. Uh, he really is having an impact with his books and with his speaking around the, uh, North America. But what fascinates me, Rick, to begin with, is that you didn't grow up with a very good model. And I'm wondering, first of all, tell me about that, but then how did your uh, vision for fathering, husbanding uh, emerge? Well, yeah, that's an interesting point. And, you know, I, did, I grew up in an alcoholic home, didn't have a good uh, role model in that regard. Uh, my stepfather was, you know, did the best he could, I'm sure, but he hadn't had that modeled for him either. And so I think, you know, what I tried to do is, is recognize what I didn't want to do <laughs> as an adult, as a father. And that's really how I started out until I was able to recognize the power of finding some positive male role models. And, and of course, this was all before I came to, to Christ. I, I became a Christian about 14 years ago. So I didn't have that model at that time either, which was uh, a, a big detriment. But you know, really, I think my wife probably gets most of the credit for us being married 30 years still. Uh, some yeah. of the sacrifices she made, and she really took to heart that we were married till death do us part, whereas that wasn't what was modeled for me necessarily. And so I think she made some sacrifices and, and to, to fulfill that commitment that really kept us together during now those when you, years. Now, when you were looking for, for male models <clears throat> as, a, as a teenager, where did you look? Well, thankfully, I was pretty athletic, so I was involved in a lot of sports, and I had a lot of good role models through coaching, um, through some of that kind of stuff. I've always been a, a big fan of movies. Um, so, you know, movies are a great opportunity, I think, especially with males, because we're so visual, to find positive and negative uh, character traits in men and, and to see how those are played out in a very dynamic way. Hmm. Uh, so you were, what, about 40 years of age when you came to faith? I was 40 years of age. 40 years of age. How long had you been married at age 40? I've been married 15 years, well, so, 16 years. So when you say your wife made sacrifices and you really give her credit for you being married 30 years, what kind of sacrifices was she making? Well, I, I think there were times where I was ready to say that's it. I mean, I'm leaving. And she probably swallowed some, some uh, things that she wouldn't necessarily wanted to deal with or put up with in order to keep us together. Um, not, not that I was out, you know, fooling around or or was necessarily an alcoholic or a drug addict or anything, but I think there were just some sacrifices in relationships that we don't, don't really think of that, that I probably took for granted at that time that she was willing to make, and I wasn't. Now, you connected with your biological father when you were 24. What impact did that have on you? It was a huge impact. Uh, him and his wife have been just a great role model for Suzanne, my wife and I, throughout the years in just showing us how a married couple interacts, what a, what a healthy marriage looks like, and for also for loving us unconditionally. I mean, you know, frankly, we were, I was doing some things that, you know, probably I shouldn't have been doing at that time, and, and yet they loved us unconditionally throughout that whole process. Well, did your biological father ever discuss with you openly and, and, and uh, transparently why uh, he left? Yeah, we've talked about it, and, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, he'd been over in, in Korea serving, and um, he just didn't think things, the timing worked out necessarily well. And, um, of course, he realizes, you know, as soon as I was born, we look exactly alike. So um, he realized his mistake, but I think it was too late at that time. And, and uh, my mom was kind of uh, not willing to allow us to have a relationship the whole time that I was growing up. And so you knew that your stepfather was your stepfather? I found out when I was 12 during an argument. When you that, were 12? That, that my stepfather was not my biological During an father. argument? During an argument they were having, yes. What impact did that have on you? Well, it was a huge, I felt it was huge, but you know, when you come from a dysfunctional home like that, one of the things is that, uh, you know, grief and those kinds of things are no big deal. And it's like, you know what, that's not that big a deal. Quit worrying about it. It was like not an acknowledgement that that was any kind of an issue. But I remember being pretty devastated at the time about it. At that point, did you uh, determine that one day you would meet your biological father? Um, I, I, you know, it's interesting when you're that age and you're so mixed up, you're going into adolescence, yeah. things are confusing anyway, you're in this chaotic environment. And I actually remember uh, getting a letter from him at that time and 
in some kind of misguided sense of loyalty to my stepfather because I craved this acceptance from him, saying that I wasn't interested in meeting him. Now, in the back of my mind, I think obviously I did throughout the years. And what was that meeting like at age 24? It was very interesting. Um, obviously, there was a lot of apprehension and, and even f f fear probably involved in it, but um, it was kind of neat when I went to the hotel and, and he opened the door. It was really like looking in a mirror at myself, you know, 20 years down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, the book, Becoming Your Spouse's Better Half. Now, you've written a number of books that relate to fathering, being, being uh, an effective dad, being a husband, and so on. And uh, you just keep ch churning out this good stuff. And I, uh, when I was reading your book, uh, you know, I've got a fairly good short-term memory. I'm not sure how long I'll remember, you know, 20, 20 uh, days from now. And so I don't make a lot of um, underlines, but on page 91, uh, this is your chapter on the man as a protector of his wife. You say, God gave a man the authority to lead his wife and family. The best way that a man carries out that directive is by serving his wife. Mm. Now, there has been all kinds of discussion, debate, uh, needless uh, kerfuffles over what headship means, uh, you know, who's in control uh, of, of the home. And a lot of it is just uh, immature talk. Uh, this is the first time in a long time I've seen the juxtaposition of authority and service. Mm -hmm. uh, explain. Well, I think as our culture, and in part of that is even in the church, I think we, you know, you alluded to some of the mixed up mm. theories that we have on this. And, and really the truth is, is that God has given men a tremendous power. And it's not a power of being bigger and stronger. It's a generational power that by the things that we do or don't do today, we're going to impact people's lives probably for hundreds of years people that we don't even know. And so with that power comes great responsibility. And, and we need to teach our young men that that responsibility is that we don't live selfish lives. We live lives lifting up other people's lives to make them better than they could possibly be without, without us in their lives. And that has got to be one of the best definitions of love you'll ever find. And of leadership. And of masculinity. Yeah, yeah. Um, was leadership ever an issue for you? I mean, you. Was it before you came to the Lord? Uh, does it continue to be after, or was it never an issue for you? I think like most women, my wife yearn, yearned for me to, to provide leadership. I'm not sure it was very healthy leadership in the first 15 or 16 years. I think after I came to Christ, I had some of the similar uh, apprehensions that a lot of men do about leading spiritually. You know, my wife was a lot more spiritually mature than I was. Uh, but it was it was amazing to me how quickly m my wife and and children fell in behind me when I just started showing just a touch of spiritual leadership. I think women and children in our culture crave that, and they're just like they were just like dry sponges. That's probably the most common thing I hear from women is that they they wish their husband would lead more spiritually in the home. Okay, so we got a lot of husbands listening to you right now, what, and they're they're asking the question. I'll ask it on their behalf. What do you mean by spiritual leadership? What does that look like? Well, I think. I think one of the things that we can do that's, it's not necessarily easy, but it, it, it probably the biggest impact that we can make in our wives and kids' lives is to pray with them. Um, when my wife, my wife and I try to pray together every night, and, and it makes a huge difference in our marriage when, when we do that. Um, I, the statistics are that 50% of couples get divorced. Couples that pray together faithfully, 1% get divorced. So, you know, there's that huge thing there. The, the thing that I need to remember as a man is that if I don't initiate that, it doesn't happen. My wife, will, even if she wants to, will seldom ask me to pray with her. Because I think that's part of the leadership that God has given us as men in, a, in the lives of our wives and children is to pray with them and for them. One percent of marriages that pray together divorce? That's the 1%. study that I've seen. Wait, why do you suppose that is? What is it about prayer that is so bonding? Well, first of all, it creates great intimacy between people, and that's why it's important not to pray with someone of the opposite gender, opposite sex, unless you have you know, your spouse or somebody with you. But also you're bringing God into that dynamic. So now you've got God involved in a very tight bond, cleaved together with husband and wives, and it and, and makes us, definitely makes us greater as a, as a team than we are individually. The, the sum of our parts is greater than us individually. You're very good at describing uh, women. You've obviously done a lot of research. I mean, you're a man, so you got to do some research, right? But you also know your wife pretty well. Yeah. No, not that I understand women, but yeah, <laughs> I've done a lot of research. Yeah. <laughs> Venus and Mars. 
Um, when you when you talk about women in the latter part of the book, there's a lot of really really excellent uh, material there. But uh, one thing that just jumped out at me, and I, I, Maura and I alluded to it a few minutes ago, and that is the influence of a father on a little girl. Uh, talk to me about that. Right. Uh, you know, fathers, and, and we you summed it up really good, is, is, you know, if you love your daughter unconditionally, that's, I mean, we really represent a heavenly father as an earthly father, and a lot of us don't get that. Had a great um, story. Uh, my wife and I were driving down the, the road, and we were listening to the radio, and there was a woman on there talking about she had four small children all under the age of six, and, and she, her husband left her, and she was just overwhelmed. I mean, and she was crying out to God, and she was praying, and just completely overwhelmed and she couldn't felt like she couldn't go on and she heard God say to her well what can you do and she said well you know I suppose I could do the dishes if I had to and he, he said well then just do the dishes sweet baby girl and I'll, I'll take care of the rest and I looked over at my wife and she was crying and you know I'm not I'm, I'm a guy I don't really get what's going on I'm like why are you crying and she's like well I grew up without a dad I can't imagine a heavenly father calling me his sweet baby girl and I thought, well, this, this woman on the radio was from the South. And I thought, well, I said, well, maybe that's a Southern thing, right? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, you call our daughter Kelsey, sweet baby girl, all the time. And so when she got home, she was relating this story to our daughter. And before she could get to that part, our daughter said, daddy calls me his sweet baby girl all the time. And then she went on to tell my wife about this card that I had given her that she has on her mirror in the bathroom in her apartment that says, I don't even remember giving it to her. It says something like, you can never really love others or yourself until you love others or something like that. But I signed it, love you always, sweet baby girl, love daddy. And I thought, how humbling is that, that the, the, the very relationship that she's able to garner for her heavenly father is directly related to the things that I do or don't do today. Uh, with my daughter, I used to, uh, I was always affirming her, of course, and telling her how beautiful she was and how smart she was. But uh, when she was into you know, her uh, six, seven, eight years of age stage, I used to take her out uh, maybe once a quarter, just her and I, for uh, a hamburger or mm -hmm. something. And, uh, and I, I would just listen to her and have her talking about life. Then I used to uh, send her a dozen roses on Valentine's Day mm -hmm. and uh, give her special treatment on her birthday. Now, her mother was doing similar stuff, but my sense was that everything I did for her was an investment in her future. Right. And it was, uh, it was intentional, but it was also from my heart. Uh, and I, I'm convinced that uh, when a little girl knows her dad loves her, she's not going to look for love in any other right. place. You're absolutely right. you know, And she's going she's to choose a man who is going to um, reflect her father's love and stability. Right. But it's also true of sons, is it not? A son needs a dad uh, as, a, as a strong moral anchor and as a coach, as a model, mm. uh, as uh, someone to affirm him. Well, you're absolutely right. And, and just to follow up on what you said before, one of the things that I talk about in the book that I, I think is important for men to recognize as husbands is that if they want to understand their wife and her spiritual walk and how to lead her spiritually is to look at her relationship with her father right. because that provides a lot of key insights into that. But no, you're absolutely right. I mean, sons, we have to have that model for us. Again, because we're so visual as males, we need to see that modeled, how a man loves a woman what his role is as a husband, as a father, as a man, um, things like that, for us to be able to internalize that. Now, you not only write books, you, you go out on speaking tours, and you were just saying to me before I went to air that uh, you wanted to tell me a story about something recently. Well, it was, it was interesting, because this, this particular book is written for husbands and wives to read together. It's got seven chapters yeah. for men and seven chapters for women in, in about men. Yeah. And the first, of course, I, if I wanted to get men interested, the first chapter I had to get would be on sex, right? Course, yeah. So I was at a, a very large men's conference speaking, and they had asked me to speak from the main stage, and then they asked me to do a breakout session on this book, Becoming Your Spouse's Better Half. I said, sure. A couple months later, I go to the conference, and I'm looking over the um, participants' manual, and, and I look at the workshops, the breakout session, and it says, Rick Johnson, Becoming Your Spouse's Better Half, How to Get More Sex Out of Your Marriage. And I'm like, wait, that's not what... But you know what I did is I gave the same talk I was going to because my talk was on meeting the needs of your wife, right. how to meet those needs. And, and the truth is, is if we want a better sex life, that's what we need to do. Now, I was surprised when I was given that talk because I was getting no feedback from the men whatsoever. But it was because they were so intensely involved. Afterwards, I had so many men come up to me, uh, literally choked up, thanking me on telling them how they can meet the needs of their wives because... 
as you know, as men, that's what we want. We want to meet the needs of our wives, but we don't always know how, especially if it hasn't been modeled for us. You know, uh, Dad gave me some advice when I was about 12. I, I was waxing, you know, quite uh, eloquent about uh, women, and he was listening very patiently <laughs> to my wisdom at 12 years of age. But um, he said, you know, James, uh, whoever you marry, he said, it's got to be a girl that you cannot imagine living without. Mm. And he said, secondly, every day of your married life, however long it is, you must tell her you love her at least 12 times a day. Right. Now, he's overstating it a bit, but the point he was making was, do what I do, because I would hear him telling my mom that he loved her, it seemed all the time. He was coming up behind her, he was hugging her, he was telling her how beautiful it was, he'd pat her on the butt, you know, and, and, and you know, my dad's a big, strong preacher guy, you know, but he loved my mom right. totally. And, and I, I just assume that's how you, how you love a woman. And so Kathy and I have a little um, kind of a pet phrase that we'll ask each other. Have I told you lately that I love you? Mm. And she'll look at me with sparkle in her eyes and say, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've already told her about seven times that day. Right. But the point is, tell me again. Two key fundamental things that women need to hear. Again, women process information. They process emotions through verbal communication. Every day they need to hear that I love you and that you're beautiful. Yeah. Two things that speak to the heart of every woman. Yeah, yeah. and also uh, commending her for a job well done. You know, when she goes the second mile and pre prepares a special meal or just does something you don't expect, uh, tell her what a great mom she is, what a great cook she is, what a great business manager, if she is a great, I, I tell my wife what a great Harley rider she is. <laughs> but uh, affirm, 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 right, right, Rick? Absolutely, and I think that's really important for, for husbands and wives. I think most of us feel unappreciated, and so I think that's a really important part of having a good relationship. Well, you know what? Becoming Your Spouse's Better Half is one of the best coaching books I've read. Why di Differences Make a Marriage Great is Rick Johnson is the author. Ravel is the publisher. You're going to want this book, friends. Go into your local bookstore, pay for it, of course, and walk out a better man. Thanks for coming our way, Rick. Thanks, Jim.